My topic this morning is economic inequality. And when socialism fell in China, Russia, the Eastern Bloc countries decades ago, the socialists strategized and realized they couldn't run for power on the basis that they could do so on the basis of economic performance, and they strategized and came up with a two-prong strategy to capture the minds of people, and one of those was global warming, and the other was economic inequality, that they would run on the basis of establishing economic equality, fairness, equity, as well as saving the planet. And it was a great strategy because there are two things that it's easy to convince the man on the street who doesn't have a lot of basis in fact, and more importantly, doesn't have any basis in theory to distrust those two particular strategies. So I'm not, obviously not going to be talking about global warming, but I am going to be talking about economic inequality today. And you're going to see that the Austrian perspective is usually just the exact opposite of that approach. And I put words here in, in quotation marks because they have a little bit of normative content to them as well as scientific or positive content, but Austrians love economic inequality, and we're going to see exactly why today. We're also going to look at the fact that there's many types of things in society that are associated with the words equality and inequality. And basically, what I mentioned just now is that socialists want to use coercion in order to solve the problem of, the so-called problem of economic inequality. And basically what we're gonna see is that their approach is just based on a lot of lies, distortions, and the fact that a lot of information and content and truth is unrevealed or unseen by the average person. So we're going to be using reality. History is our guide, but you absolutely need theory. And I want to start with a quote from Ludwig von Mises from his book, Human Action, towards the end in chapter 35, section 3 on inequality. Now, I've recently done an episode of my podcast, on this topic, the podcast of uh, unanimity is the name of the podcast. The topic is economic inequality. And basically, I go into great detail about this quote. Now, I'm sure I saw this quote long ago and probably many times, but I didn't actually grab this quote for the lecture today until this week. Um, but it summarizes basically what I cover in that podcast. Quote, even those who look upon inequality of wealth and income as a deplorable thing cannot deny that it makes for progressing capital accumulation. And it is additional capital accumulation alone that brings about technological improvement, rising wage rates, and a higher standard of living. And the concept of higher standard of living can be misleading. It's not the fact that the people at the very top are raised even higher. The standard of living basically refers to everyone in society. So it refers to basically everyone from the bottom to the top. And so standards of living are things like, do you or do you not have running water in your household? 
Okay, so in the United States and many other places in the world, that's part of the standard of living. It doesn't matter if you're dirt poor or you're filthy rich, everybody that has that standard of living has running water in their house. So that's Mises. That's very important. I urge you to check out my podcast to get a sort of walk through the history of humanity about the idea of greater and greater levels of inequality and higher and higher standards of living. Next, I want to quote Murray Rothbard from the book Egalitarianism and is a revolt against reason. And by the way, this is the last day to apply for the fall 2024 virtual Mises Book Club, which is going to be going through that book. So uh, if you're interested in participating in that book club, um, I would urge you to look at that um, on the events page of Mises and apply today to be part of that. Quoting Rothbard, If men were like ants, there would be no interest in human freedom. If individual men, like ants, were uniform, interchangeable, devoid of specific personality traits, and when, I, when Rothbard says men, he means men and women, so sometimes I know he may sound like men actually are like ants. Um, well, then who would care whether they were free or not? Who indeed would care if they lived or died? The glory of the human race is the uniqueness of each individual, the fact that every person, though similar in many ways to others, possesses a completely individuated personality of his own. It is the fact of each person's uniqueness, the fact that no two people can be wholly interchangeable, that makes each and every man irreplaceable and that makes us care whether he lives or dies, whether he is happy or oppressed. And finally, it is the fact that these unique personalities need freedom for their full development that constitutes one of the major arguments for the free society. So one of the things that you've covered here this week is the various types of income the various roles that people play in society and the types of income that accrue as a result of their productive efforts in those roles. So there's obviously labor. That's the oldest productive factor, you know, dating back into eons in the past when people just used their own power to produce uh, a subsistence standard of living. Uh, but in, of course, in modern days, they earn wages and benefits, et cetera, from working. And very often, of course, in fact, in almost all cases, they're not using their own brute human force, but they're using mechanized power of various sorts. Then there are the old classical term landlords or property or resource owners who earn rents that are due to their decisions and efforts related to the ownership of resources and property and that results from resource stewardship, okay? Taking care of our resources and making sure that they're put to their highest valued output. And then, of course, the capitalists, we've gone through that this week, who earn interest. Uh, they, they accumulate savings from incomes, and then they provide those savings in various ways into the capitalist production process, and they earn an interest rate of return. So, for example, the entrepreneurs, uh, they have to pay their labor immediately upon the completion of the work effort, or maybe at the end of the week or the end of the month, the capitalist provides savings in order to make that possible, and in return is paid interest. And then, of course, the entrepreneur gets the leftovers uh, for bearing uncertainty and risks uh, from 
production efforts. Uh, so, you know, whatever's left over um, from bearing that uncertainty, if it's successful, there's profits. If not, well, maybe there's losses. So these are the types of incomes, but of it, you know, we all we all save, we all bear uncertainty of the future. So an individual person owns uh, gets various different types of income so that a business owner may manage the operations of a firm as well as cleaning the bathrooms or helping in the kitchen. Uh, and as a result, might theoretically be earning all four types of income streams. So income creation as a result of adding value into production so that we can consume. This is the production side. So with respect to incomes, the first P is production, and it's obviously uh, necessary. Now, when it comes to income redistribution, there are three Ps. Uh, the first is plunder, uh, and this goes back a long time as well, and that's basically income that's taken from the income producer uh, and redistributed from producers to parasites, whether they be bureaucrats, people on welfare, crony capitalist, etc. And this is a plunder is another way, um, if you want to use a P, uh, for taxation. Taxation decreases overall production and reduces the standard of living. Privilege is the next P. Uh, these are artificial rights or privileges uh, granted by the state to particular select individuals, and this redistributes income to these privileged groups from consumers and excluded producers. So when the government grants a privilege to a certain group of people, they're going to exclude others from competing in that same production area. For example, doctors. Doctors get a license uh, to practice their trade, and other people who would like to, maybe different types of doctors, can be excluded. So these are monopoly grants from government uh, such as professional licenses. This also decreases production and it reduces the standard of living. So the final P is the purpose of plunder and privilege, and that is basically to allow the state to control a larger number of people and thus be able to better exploit the overall economy because the state is actually represents a very small number of people, and so they have to gain supporters. And so handing out welfare benefits, for example, gets people to support them. Handing out paychecks to bureaucrats gets people to support the state. Prop writing checks to propagandists makes it easier for the state to get control over the population and exploit people. So I looked at um, various aspects of human inequality. There's a long list uh, here of different aspects in ways in which we're unequal, starting with the physical and biological areas uh, age and sex and things of that nature, physical strength, um, those things have obviously become less and less important uh, as capitalism has developed. Uh, things like your size, strength, uh, youth and vitality, uh, so forth, have become far less important, thank goodness. Um, and the rest of them, taste, preferences, uh, intelligence, talents, education, your taste for late labor versus leisure, your risk tolerance, um, all of these things 
they're all up in your mind. So the things that have become more and more important are basically what you get to decide up here. Okay? Am I a risk taker or not? Am I lazy or am I a workaholic? Uh, those are all things that may have some biological component to it, but we know that we can obviously change those things just by changing our mind on certain things. So we all have a comparative advantage, which was another one of the lectures this week. Um, and income is the catalactic reality of that comparative advantage. How much value do we add to overall production in the economy? Now, just as there are some obvious aspects of inequality, there are dubious types of equality in markets. Um, so, you know, the idea that we're equal, you know, Rothbard basically dismisses that across the board. Um, there's maybe more or less equality of, in some sense, but uh, innate equality or equality by birth um, are, these are things that are obviously wrong scientifically. Um, it doesn't mean people are better or worse. It means they're different. Um, equality of opportunity, that's obviously wrong. Everybody agrees uh, with that. Um, and equality of result, the idea that we can rig society to guarantee we all might end up equal in economic terms or in social terms um, is obviously wrong in practice. Uh, every time policy is used to try to achieve those kind of things, they backfire um, and are very harmful. Economics recognizes that as a reality. Um, But there's a lot of different types of equality, and that's what the socialists are sort of counting on, is the confusion in our minds when they say equality. Well, it seems like, well, yeah, we're kind of pro-equality. Um, but we need to have a strong sense of reality in the background there, or we'll just simply be duped by the socialist Marxist propaganda. Now there are various systems of inequality. In fact, because of this natural inequality of people, every system of people is going to have inequality associated with that, whether it's natural law or the rule of law or whether it's any kind of political system from theocracy to monarchy, democracy, dictatorship, socialism, etc., there's a natural inequality of those systems, which are basically in unnecessary. The liberal mind, of which the Austrians are very much a part of, liberal in the European sense, um, is one that reacted very negatively against any kind of caste system where people are essentially cast and kept in a particular social strata because of their birth, their skin color, etc. cetera. Uh, liberals reacted against that. That's why the, um, the European liberals um, and the modern Austrians are opposed to things like slavery and why they pushed uh, efforts to eliminate caste structures in society and replacing them with freedom. So the only sort of equality that's built into any of these systems that you might hear discussed this week are in natural law or the rule of law as well as in the marketplace itself, there is the concept of equality under the law. Okay, so the legal system 
does have aspects where people under the law are created, or excuse me, are treated uh, equally. Now, human development requirements, uh, this is something you'll find at great length uh, in Mises' Human Action and in Rothbard's book on egalitarianism. Um, and I explain this also in the podcast on economic inequality. Um, but basically, there's a, there's a series of requirements uh, or steps and stages that lead to human development that took us from a more or less animal man of hunter-gatherers, people without places to live, clothing, any kind of reliable food supply, medicine, really anything you can think of, uh, and the only form of running water was maybe if the stream was flowing um, to where we are today. And I'm not going to go through any great detailed analysis uh, of what's involved here. Mises says, quote, the diversity of nature, which, which does not repeat itself, but creates the universe an infinite inexhaustible variety. So reality and nature are one thing, but the transformation of nature that humans have been able to accomplish through freedom, through going beyond a subsistence standard of living over time, but in particular during the Industrial Revolution, when capitalism developed, where the division and specialization, specialization of labor started to really take place is when we saw an increase in productivity, an increase in labor specialization, and the bringing forth of savings into capital and into technology. So every history course, high school and college, they talk about technological history, uh, but that's usually divorced somehow from the history of the Industrial Revolution, which was nothing but, you know, exploitation of labor, poverty, impoverishment, abuse, uh, children having to work, and so on and so forth, a complete divorce of the history. Uh, people wanted to move to the cities, they wanted to move to the factories because it was a source of higher, more dependable income and also greater opportunities to survive, to exist, to thrive, and to have a good time, okay? Uh, living out on the farm at the whims of some uh, royal landlord uh, were much worse conditions. So through the Industrial Revolution and capital accumulation and technological development, really, we had the first sustained increase in the standard of living. Now, going back a few slides, it's important to note that every role that I talked about earlier, the laborer, the capitalist, the resource owner, the entrepreneur, they all are harder than it looks. And typically, that starts with your education. I've seen economics textbooks you know, when they describe what the entrepreneur does, the entrepreneur gets to keep all the profits without any explanation for the role of the entrepreneur. Or the capitalist just earns, sits back and earns interest while the labor is toiling away endlessly um, 
and getting a subsistence standard of living. Every role is actually much harder than it looks. Capitalist families deprive themselves of consumption in order to save and acquire capital. It takes a long time for that capital to accumulate over time. And if at some point they reverse their decisions or subsequent generations uh, of the family decide to do otherwise, that capital can be quickly dissipated. Or maybe a war comes along and the state taxes away all the capital. Or a Marxist regime comes into place and taxes away all the capital. So there's nothing easy about it. And of course, I think you're all aware of how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur. Bearing uncertainty is not just sitting back in a chair and looking at the stock market tables. And the important thing for everyone to recognize is that the media portrays only the super success stories of entrepreneurs and capitalists. You're only going to see a story about a particular individual or a particular family once they accumulate a billion dollars or once they become a multi-billionaire uh, or once they enter the Forbes list. Um, and that's not necessarily the fault of the media. I mean, we also only want to know about our favorite football player or favorite basketball player or our favorite singer or our, fav our favorite musician. You know, the fact that we're, you know, there's a, a million guitar pickers out there, but we only know the names of very few who have made a spectacular success. So there's only a few way, way, way up there at the top as there are in any profession, doctors, lawyers, economists, you know, there's a few in every profession that make millions and millions of dollars. But the vast majority in any profession are making relatively ordinary incomes. So remember that it's only the spectacular successes that you're made aware of. Okay, and I've already covered this slide about incomes in the free market. Labor is paid immediately. Landlords are paid over time. Uh, they get paid now, but they also are worried about, well, how much am I going to get paid next time, next month, next year, the year after? You know, I own this big ranch, or I own this big farmland, or whatever, or I own, you know, city blocks, or whatever. Uh, you know, I have to be worried about how much am I going to make today, but also how much I'm going to make 10 years from now. So the person who owns Mama Goldberg's next door, well, they want to know how much they're going to make this year, but they're also concerned, you know, how much is this property going to be worth 10 years or 20 years from now? Okay, the socialist strategy um, which I've also mentioned, uh, that after socialism fell and was shown to be inefficient and untenable, really, um, the socialists changed strategies and switched from efficiency to equity, something that they knew they could snow uh, a lot of people uh, with inexact misleading statistics. And then, of course, the other prong of that strategy is global warming. They want to take over. They want to have technocratic control uh, without any real science or justice behind it. But if they have technocrats in control, then they can control our lives by telling us, well, this is absolutely necessary. We need to do this for equity, or we need to do this for the environment. Uh, what biases income distribution? This is also important. Uh, we've looked at some of this uh, government plunder 
in government monopolies, but something that sometimes gets underplayed but is very important here is that the central bank also systematically redistributes income and wealth, and this is sort of a reverse Robin Hood effect in that the central bank redistributes income and wealth surreptitiously from the productive classes, lower, middle, upper middle income classes through inflation and redistributes it to the upper end of income and wealth. So the people who can take advantage of Fed policy are people who already have lots of money. Okay, so, um, well, the government takes advantage of it itself uh, by the Fed buying up all of its debt, uh, but also large corporations can take advantage of low interest rate policy and borrow tons of money uh, at those low interest rates. In any case, the political class benefits and the productive class loses. Now, in addition, the, the two main things, I guess the main th empirical themes um, that I want to put forth today and for you to follow up too. Uh, the first is this long history of growing economic inequality or just economic inequality and human development and rising standards of living. In other words, we couldn't have gotten from an animalistic type existence to where we are today without economic inequality. So there's a long historical narrative there um, of human history. The second empirical uh, example is how government statistics bias the debate. And I want to cover a few aspects of a recent book called The Myth of American Inequality, How Government Biases the Policy Debate. And basically all of the statistics that have been floated out there and have been used to create almost uncountable little memes about how unfair the current system is are based on faulty government statistics. And these are not you know, errors in the data. These are the way the statistics are constructed. For example, they do not count all of the welfare dollars that are given away. And they do not count all of the tax dollars that are taken away. So the numbers you see are not based on the full picture. That, and that picture that you're presented is that America is getting worse and worse and we try to tax more money and we try to give more welfare benefits and it just doesn't seem to get any better. It only seems to get worse. But the fact is that if we actually count the numbers correctly and we include all of the welfare dollars given away and we include all of the productive dollars that are taxed away, you see an entirely different picture. And I'll, I'll sort of wrap that up by noting that we've also given up a lot in terms of opportunity cost. So uh, in this graph, basically the red shaded area is the taxes that are taken away, and the green shaded area is all the welfare benefits that have been given to people. And so between the first and second quartile, you have 20% of American households existing pretty well, by the way. If you add them up, it's almost $50,000 a year for a family of four. 
in that first quartile of income distribution. And then at the top, in the fifth quintile, excuse me, in the fifth quintile, the top 20%, you see all of the taxes that are taken away. Uh, and in the middle quintile, you see that there is a break-even point uh, where the amount of welfare benefits and taxes are completely offset. But the solid line, I mean, the, 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 the dashed line is the line that's being reported to you. That's the line that's being, all the memes are being created and the stories by journalists are being created using the dashed line. But in effect, the after government policy line is the solid line. So that indicates that there's really, um, in the United States, we have the most progressive income tax system and we have the most generous welfare system in the world by far. So the, the fact that we're still being called nasty, brutish, evil, immoral is really besides the point. And it's all a bunch of statistical trickery. And it also means that we're giving up a lot of opportunity. In the official poverty rate, um, the welfare program started in earnest in 1965. And at that point, the before the welfare programs, the poverty rate in the United States fell from over 35% at the end of World War II down to about 11% on the eve of the welfare programs. Since all of these welfare programs, literally trillions and trillions of dollars given away cumulatively, the poverty rate has stayed essentially about the same. Whereas in the absence of all of these welfare programs and individuals not being trapped in welfare, but some of them actually becoming very productive members of the economy, people have estimated that the poverty rate in the United States today would be somewhere between 2 and 4%, not 12 to 15%. Okay, I, um, I'll just mention here um, the two cases in history where we got much more economic equality where the people at the bottom and the people at the very top, where the differences in their wealth and income shrank. So the wealthy and the poor, there's two solid episodes where the gap between those two shrank. They became more equal. The first was the Black Death in... Um, the 1300s in Europe, where one third to one half of the population died because of the plague. Okay, so there was an, an immense depopulation throughout Europe and the surrounding areas. The Mediterranean, um, the Eastern Black Sea area, um, one third to one half of the population died. As a result, labor gained relative to landowners and capitalists. In other words, because so many workers died and all of the houses and structures and cleared farmland was still in existence, the workers became in much more demand and were much more productive. And so for a period of several decades, wage rates for labor increased and returns from land ownership fell. So if you're looking for e equality you, and you g get access to a time machine, just set it to go back to the Black Death, 1347, and you'll be right in your element. The other period was 
post-World War II America. This is the one that Thomas Piketty uh, and many other socialist and Marxist look at as an example. We want to go back and exploit whatever we did uh, during that period because workers rose up with wages and capitalists and entrepreneurs didn't. And so there was more equality, Gini coefficients, Lorenz curves improved, all that kind of stuff. Um, but what they leave out of their statistical analysis, which they admit is pretty weak, is the fact that many generations prior to the post-World War II era were killed off. Okay, so around the world, tens of millions of people died during World War I. Uh, tens of millions died because of the Spanish flu. Uh, then we had the Great Depression, which reduced, reduced um, incomes to the point where people didn't feel that they could get married and have a lot of children. Uh, and so there was a depopulation aspect of that. And then, of course, World War II, where millions died all around the world. So there was a general suppression of the population and childbearing for a period of many decades. And so when peace and freedom broke out after World War II, which the Keynesians were absolutely petrified about, labor actually did really well. So again, uh, there's empirical support for the notions that I've been expressing about the differences of a theoretical level in terms of equality and inequality. And I want to thank you for paying attention today. My, my weekly podcast is called Minor Issues, which comes out on Saturday morning. But the one that I referred to today is the Unanimity Pro Podcast. It's also on Mises.org. Um, it doesn't, it only comes out monthly. So, uh, but the last one I did was on economic inequality, taking you through the history of humanity. Thank you. <laughs>